Fulbright is possibly the most prestigious government scholarship that you can receive.
Yeah, the, the front light ne needs to be killed here. Anyway, so um, before I grab my, my pizza and, and before they turn off the light, I want to ask how many of you are Fulbright alums yourselves? Oh, pretty good. How many will be Fulbrighters? Everybody else raise your hand. Okay, good. All right, all right. That trick worked. Okay, all right, that's great. So please, please roll the movie. There are two of them. One of them is called What Did You Achieve During Your Grant? These are mostly... On one film, there are, there are Americans who are in Hungary now or just, just, just left a semester ago. And the other film is about what does it take to be a good applicant. That, that's a more general audience. Okay. And then once we get done with that, then we'll talk about opportunities for scholars, uh, both research and lecturing. Okay. Is that fine? Thank you. Fulbright is possibly the most prestigious government scholarship that you can receive uh, to teach, study, or research at a, an American university. I planned uh, to, to apply for a Fulbright scholarship uh, when I was a, a PhD student during my university years, but I, I didn't feel myself uh, enough uh, for a Fulbright, for, for this very prestigious uh, exchange program. But uh, time has changed and it, it, it was really interesting uh, because uh, I won this uh, scholarship as a university lecturer. I am afraid a little bit whether <laughs> my application will be successful or not. But uh, I was so happy when I got the positive answer and I could start my, my scholarship. The chair of uh, the Fulbright board, uh, we interview quite a lot of people. Uh, I always emphasize that uh, uh, what they should uh, uh, do is uh, not just to uh, promote their own uh, career and uh, getting ahead in their own profession, but uh, to be quote-unquote ambassadors of Hungary and at the same time, uh, to establish as many links, professional, personal links as possible uh, in the U.S. Uh, uh, between uh, institutions, uh, uh, university departments, uh, colleges, uh, labs, uh, research labs, uh, think tanks and so on, and uh, to promote this sort of friendship, uh, not just a professional but personal friendship between two countries. It's just a way to, to, to change your mindset. And I regard my Fulbright experience as an El Camino because I have learned so much, not only during the experience, uh, but also since then. I have a new perspective on the whole world. For anyone who's interested in finding new approaches to their field, I would recommend Fulbright for everyone wholeheartedly. It is a true game changer. Fulbright really helped me push my limits. It helped me establish a very strong professional network. Fulbright was a great opportunity, not just for me to conduct research, but also for my family to, to get familiar with a different way of living, a different way of culture, uh, to have a big diversity of experiences. The biggest challenge to, to, my, to my job is to work on the selection process where you might have 25 excellent candidates and only 15 slots. It takes the wisdom of Solomon to be able to find those 15 from the 25, knowing full well what a big impact uh, we could have on their life. After three unsuccessful attempts, uh, I decided that I will try again and I don't give up. Uh, it's, it's like me, very much so. So actually, I, I tried again and I got the fellowship and I was the most happy person on the earth. And to those people who apply once and fail, we would like to encourage them to apply a second time because often we, uh, they would face competition from others who are in the same field as they are. Um, I think that Fulbright is suited for everyone. 
a lot of people don't think about applying for it because they just worry that they're not good enough for it. And I always think of the quote from Goethe, be bold and great forces will come to your aid. Fulbright in my mind is a great force. What did you notice about the, the clip? Some people got it elsewhere, okay? So this is your chance to save the reputation of BYU. That each person speaking represented a completely different field of in inquiry. And each person speaking visited an entirely different US university. In the case of the last gentleman, it was a Hungarian research institution. All right, so the message there is that any field representing any university on both sides is what, is what we're looking for. So there aren't any biases or um, preferred fields. There are fields that tend to dominate because the structure of the, of the country and the, and, the, and the skill sets of the university colleagues, but did you find the second one? Going on a Fulbright can mean so many things. But one thing is for sure. It will boost the trajectory of your life, both professionally and personally. Fulbright gave me a very big uh, booster, both in my career and uh, both in my uh, family life. It opened new perspectives, both uh, in research and in how to manage, how to communicate research. I gained a lot of new contacts, not just related to my studies, but also personal contacts, new friends, actually, and uh, lots of experiences and hands-on practice in, in film scoring. Fulbright opened a lot of doors uh, for me, uh, especially in uh, meeting with uh, filmmakers and video game developers. So I'm planning on cooperating and continuing my relationship with uh, the Institute of Political Science and International Studies. We are working on creating some kind of a student exchange program between ELTA and uh, Ryder. I'm also interested in, you know, continuing the collaboration with faculty. Professionally, I've gotten the opportunity to learn so many new things um, to advance my education. Um, completing a, a master's in, in uh, mathematics has uh, opened my eyes to a lot of areas of the field. It's, it's allowed me to develop connections with folks from um, all over Hungary um, and from all over the world. Strength, resilience throughout the year. Professionally, I also learned how to place myself in leadership positions and how to find myself those uh, leadership ways that I can most contribute to our community. I've had the opportunity to work with different Hungarian artists and Hungarian masters and learn techniques that help me in my own studio in America. The, the biggest professional achievement for me uh, is made these uh, presentations, English language presentations about Hungary and the fake news and media manipulation in Hungary. And uh, I can use these presentations uh, also in Hungary. Basically everything, everything I planned and even beyond that. Fulbright really helped me push my limits it helped me establish a very strong professional network. Whether you're looking to advance your career, study at the most prestigious universities abroad, expand your network, or just grow as a person, Fulbright will give you what you need. Realize this, but this is a test audience, right? Which of these is better, the first or the second one? You can say they both are no, yes. Maybe the, the first one was more helpful, the second maybe was more inspirational. Exactly, and that, that was the purpose behind them, yeah, okay. Um, what else? 
the, the voice, the voice on the second one was a professional actor, a guy who uh, is an actor in Chicago. He's a student. And he's in Hungary studying Hungarian theater, but he doesn't speak Hungarian. Now, how can you study theater without speaking Hungarian? Well, certain plays, like The Crucible and you know Hamlet and so forth, are repeated in many languages around the world over the past uh, you know hundreds of years and so forth. So he sits in on on these these plays and these productions, and simply observes those plays that he himself um, has uh, has starred in or has acted in, and he's writing on this theater scene, you know, as a, as, as a student grantee. But he could be easily be a faculty grantee or a scholar. So we have projects that are that, I would say, off the wall or outside of the box. And, and, the, and this is just one example. So let me, let me run through these. I know that you don't want to watch slides. You want to ask questions. But let me ask questions first. More or less, what fields are represented here? STEM, raise your hand. Okay. Arts, broadly defined, sort of. Um, social sciences, engineering, sports science. What did I leave out? Education. Education. Okay. What else did I leave out? Math. I, I guess that's them. Okay. So that helps. That helps me. Um. I'm old-fashioned. I don't trust those clickers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. I don't. Because I, don't. I never know which way to go. Here, it's down, right? On that thing, you know, you always end up going sideways or something. All right. So th there's no, not much reason to talk about this slide too much, except to say that <clears throat> Hungary joined the Fulbright program in 1978 when the Holy Crown of St. Stephen was returned by Jimmy Carter. This was, this was before the change in the political system. And by 1992, it had grown um, beyond its bilateral nature, and a Fulbright Commission was created. And I am the second director of that Fulbright Commission. My, my predecessor was in that office for, for over, over 20 years. And there are quite a few countries involved in the Fulbright program around the globe. And the question you may ask is, well, Hungary is just one of the 50 Fulbright Commissions around the world and just one of the 150 countries in the Fulbright program. Why am I talking about just just hungry. But I want to say a few things about some of our neighbors, what opportunities they seek, and what differences and, 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 the, and the similarities we have with, let's say, the Polish program or the Romanian program and so forth. So um, the commission in Budapest has a 24-7, you know, 365 day a year care program for the grantees. As my prepaid, with, uh, pre, uh, <clears throat> my volunteer up here, Ryan, would, would, would say to you, um, and this is quite serious. So if you come to a country that has 15 to 25 American grantees in the country at any particular point in time, and then we know each one by name, and, and we know all of their problems, we know their families. And so we're able to take care of them in terms of making sure that their host institution is the correct one, making sure that host institution takes care of them, helping them with connections to other alumni in the country, and in and, and general problems such as getting their Schengen visa lined up, and finding a school or babysitter or Hungarian lessons or whatever is needed. So we do we put a lot of emphasis on, on taking care of the grantees. And this extends to things like monthly excursions to the countryside, to museums, to cultural events. And almost in all cases, you, you can bring your family, you know, so little kids, spouses, big kids, and so on and so forth. So we try to be a family-friendly uh, country as much as possible. This is the class of 22. Right, program characteristics. Basically, all subject fields are, are desirable, are available. We get, let's say, 20, 25 applications on the scholar side for 13 to 15 slots. That, this number changes uh, yearly based on budget implications, as well as based on how many slots we're allowed to have by the State Department. After COVID, we had such a large run-up in people making up for, the, for lost time that they had to cut back the number of slots for, 
23, 24, but we should be back on track with 14 or 15 uh, scholar slots for academic year 24, 25. So that's what you can count on. Number of applicants, well, that, that tends to vary, and I'll show you some slides of the numbers, but I would say you basically have a one out of two chance in the scholar category, or even better. Once you've made it through, once you've made it through to, to being, becoming a semi-finalist, how you get through that black box is a different issue. Um, you have people here on campus who can help you with that. Who are those people that can help you with that? Here you go. <laughs> as well as experienced applicants who have you know, applied successfully to other countries. So once we receive a short list, and the short list is up to twice as long as how many, however many slots we have, we choose one out of two, two out of three uh, applicants. Uh, very important, and, and, the, and the, 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 the primary consideration for me, I look at two things. One of them is the quality of the invitation letter. Does that host professor institution really want that person in their office, in their lab, in their library, in their archive during the next academic year? We actually ask them. We call them and say, so-and-so is here. Here's their file. Do you want them? How, how will you support them? If that is insufficient and we like the applicant anyway, then we try to find them a better host or a different host. That also happens. So every, every single one, I guess, is bespoke like your suits, right? Like these Hong Kong tailors that come to your town and they, and they sew you a suit. We, we try to have bespoke applicants in the sense that once they are semi-finalists, we try to match them to the best possible host. And then the second criteria is, how will that person, how will their, their, their life change? What kind of impact will they have on their host institution? And when they go back to their home, to their home institution, how will they carry forward the connections that they've made, what future plans do they have for collaboration, return visits, and so on and so forth. Critical. And then the third one, I guess I, I, I should have said three, but I didn't want to because I probably forget what the third one is. But the third one is the cultural exchange component. It's almost as important as the academic quality, I would say. You can't spend your whole time in the lab. You have to argue or dis define through, your, through the uh, CV or the personal statement or in many other places um, in the application process, what kind of hobby you may have that you can use to connect to real people. It could be cooking, could be singing in a choir, could be some kind of sports activity, some kind of coaching activity. It doesn't really matter. But you should be able to connect to people with whom you don't have a common language in, 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 in many cases. This is, this is critically important. But I think for American applicants, it's not really a problem. Volunteerism and giving back and being involved in non-government organizations, I think, is, comes naturally. But we really have to try hard with our Hungarian applicants to say, look, this is not just academic quality. You have to have different types of qualities of how do you comport yourself in the faculty lounge, what, what kind of stories do you tell, how do you um, do quick presentations about your home city, your home culture, and so on and so forth. Very, very important aspect of evaluation. Um, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, uh, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria more or less have parallel programs. In other words, we have English teaching assistants on the student side and as well as on the scholar side, researchers, lecturers, and then lecturer researchers. I personally don't see too much distinction between someone who's only doing research or only doing lecturing because you'll end up doing both anyway. You may be asked by your host to say, why don't you do a, a round table on your topic? Why don't you talk to my three graduate students and so forth? So as far as I'm concerned, unless you're not explicitly being asked to um, do only lectures, as some of our slots you know, pertain to, to only lecturing, then it's OK to say that you're going to be you know, a combination. All right? So don't worry about that. It doesn't increase or reduce your chances at all. We really try to look at the substance of your project proposal and the needs of the host institution. All right? Does that make sense? OK. While this slide pertains to students, there's something called the inter-country exchange. Do you know what that is? Inter-country exchange means that if you're in Europe, the, um, the other commissions uh, have a list of all the grantees 
and all the European uh, countries, American scholar grantees, and they are sometimes invited to conferences to give papers, to do lecturing, and so forth. Or, or you can get yourself invited to another a country that has a Fulbright Commission, and then we split the costs. Or you can go, let's say, to Berlin for a week, do lectures, or go to Poland or, or anywhere else. All right. So this is an interesting opportunity. Distances are are, are small. Uh, Low-budget airlines, I don't really like them, but they're there. Train travel exists. It's not Amtrak. It's a little bit more dense of a network than Amtrak. Um, so this is something that we highly recommend, that you get, out of, that you get outside of your cocoon, even if you're in, in the lab that you want to be in, but to, to go to a professional conference somewhere in Europe while you're on your grant. This is very important. It's important for us as well to see that you have more successes. All right, this pertains to students, so I'll just skip through these. Uh, we did have some military grantees. That was the topic of my previous discussion an hour ago, but I'll skip through here. The next slide illustrates the importance of involvement in voluntary activity. Now, this is a retired Army colonel, by the way, not Ronald, the guy in the middle. Um, with his wife, and they spent their weekends preparing meals for the Ronald McDonald House, where you know the the, the, the families of sick children could meet with their with their um, with their little patient in a safe and nice environment. But this was their voluntary activity that they brought with them from home, but they but they were able to find an English-speaking organization that was able to to bring them in um, and to take advantage of their experience. It looks like they had they had some fun. All right. These, this slide pertains to uh, the automotive industry. Any, any, anyone in here? Engineering? Was engineering here someplace? Engineering, self-driving cars, remote, remote sensing, and so forth. There is a, uh, a small German company called Audi that has the world's largest engine factory in, in Jör, Hungary. It's in Western Hungary. And they basically support the University of Jör through various grants to various departments. So anything having to do with automotive engineering, logistics, transportation, um, guidance systems, and so forth is taught uh, at this university. And they are very generous to the American scholars that have taught there. I've had a, um, a philosopher from Marymount University uh, at, at the University of Göring, and wondering why are they bringing a philosopher in to teach engineers? Because they said, look, engineers need to expand their horizons a little bit. So they brought in someone who was teaching them Greek philosophy, an American. And they put him up in a hotel that's uh, a part of the, the catering school in Jör, which means that you, you were in this apartment type of suite. So the, you, you didn't have to pay rent, and you got three meals a day. And he had Wiener Schnitzel every day for <laughs> four months. All right. I mean, it's, it, this, is, this was in his final report, because right? he really liked it so much that every day he asked for Wiener Schnitzel. Anyway, so if you go to University of Jör, you know, just a mere 100 kilometers away from Budapest, you know, about 120 from Vienna, it's almost halfway between the two cities, um, you will you'll be taken care of, and you will be a big man, sorry, big person, big pers a big a big a big thing on campus. So if you have any um, desire to be outside of the capital city, you will be well rewarded because you will be. Um, um, someone who's, who's unique, and you might, you might be able to make a lot more friends and have a lar much larger impact than you would in a crowded uh, national university. All right. And there's also a test track associated with the, uh, the automotive engineering department. Now, I, I can't promise that you'll be able to drive like Formula One cars around the test track, but that could be a part of our package. Um, here's our building where the arrow is, and that, doesn't it look like something that's just over here? No, exactly right. It's nine stories, and there's like a tenth story, which is an attic. But we're on the ninth. We're on the ninth floor, and um, at the at the technical university, which is this building here. But it's sort of in a in a uh, a multi-university environment. In other words, we have the uh, the large social science university and natural science university, Alta, is also co-located not too far from us, as well as the technical university, and so that's where our office is, and. Uh, just to show you more or less the lay of the land, and you see the, uh, you can look upstream, and somewhere in the back on the right is the, is the, is the Castle Hill. 
The Parliament, you can't see because, believe it or not, the Danube does bend enough that you can't see around the corner. So the angle is, isn't right for us. So we, can't, we can barely you know, make out the dome of the Parliament, but that's about all we can see from my window. All right, Distinguished Lecturing Awards. This may interest you. We have, <coughs> Sorry. we have this divided into two parts. One is for explicitly STEM-related topics. And it's called the John von Neumann Distinguished Award. This is a new award. We've only had two people come over so far. They both went to, to Seged to work at this um, laser institute, Extreme Light Infrastructure Institute, which is an EU-funded institute in Seged. And um, they waited until this uh, facility came online before they applied to Fulbright Hungary to come work at it. So I guess it's in, in that world of laser physics, it's an important um, destination. But the John von Neumann Distinguished Award in STEM could be for teaching and it could be for research. And you can see the, the, the topic areas, but the priority areas are vehicles, telecommunications, artificial intelligence, nuclear for atomic physics, and so forth. And we have one to two awards per year. In other words, these are one semester long awards and they pay a, a much higher um, monthly stipend than do the regular research awards. But in our catalog, you just have to tick the box. And that's all it, all it takes. The second one is the uh, ORSAC Distinguished Award in American Studies. This is uh, explicitly a teaching award for people teaching any aspect of American studies, American culture, history, politics, music, it could be anything having to do with North America, North American culture. And departments of, of English or, or um, North American studies are skewed or, or are, are thrown throughout Hungary. They're, they're distributed to, in, at, to the large universities. And um, we choose one or two of these people per year. But this is, this is for associate professor and, and up. But it's explicitly for, for teaching. We currently have a gentleman from uh, Iowa State University teaching African American uh, studies at University of Debrecen. And he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a Nigerian American, so that adds an extra twist to it. So he's an immigrant American citizen teaching Afri African American history at University of Debrecen. So it's kind of a, a long, it's a, it's a long story. But the point is, is that we, uh, we are very happy that, that uh, he found that place to be his, uh, his home for the next, uh, next couple months. Are there any people that would be interested in either of these? Okay, w which one? Neumann, right? Well, he won, uh, uh, yeah, he did a lot of stuff, right? <laughs> or show sure, game theory, for example, right? I, I, would, I would argue that that fits that, that definition, and at least it's not going to be some laser guy trying to blow things up or zap things and so forth, right? I also have an econ background, so I would agree with that. And anyone else? How about the Orsak chair? I mean, this is basically any social science. It could be arts as well. It could be theater. It could be film. You're nodding? Maybe? Okay. All right, good. Any questions about these two? And people sometimes ask me, saying, well, am I reducing my, my odds if I mark a, a specific grant versus just a general, general research or general lecturing? And I would say, you're not reducing your odds, you're increasing your odds, because there may only be one other or two other people who want that particular um, slot, and that particular position. So you, may, you will not be competing against all your peers that year, but only against somebody, somebody else who chose that particular distinguished grant. And if you're the only one, all things being equal, you have a very good chance of being selected. Right? So I would, I would not hesitate to mark a, a very narrow, narrowly defined um, grant option versus the general one. I mean, just for that reason. Because so there's the laser institute up there on the top. The other very strong um, strong suit that we have is mathematics, but this is mostly for students. Are there any math professors in here? Amazing. Okay, we'll keep going. Keep going. 
this is also for students, but I just want to mention this as a, as a cultural um, as a cultural aspect. We have uh, three or four English teaching assistants, students who, who teach uh, English and other types of, um, and use a lot of uh, fun activities to teach English by doing rather than a classroom environment. <coughs> and one of them is always assigned to a school or a college or a, uh, an honors college that works with with Roma students. And this was the result of one of those projects. Uh, the, the woman was originally a uh, high school teacher from Los Angeles, and she um, worked with these kids to collect folk tales, stories that they heard from home, you know, from home their parents or from their grandparents, and they had to write these down, then they had to translate it, then they had to make it culturally appropriate for an English-speaking audience to understand what was going on, and then the little kids were asked to, to illustrate them. And this is the artist next to... This is actually on the cover of the brochure, and that's one of the, the stories uh, illustrated in it. Um, so this, again, is the other side of what the colonel was doing with, at Ronald McDonald. We, our students are also deeply involved in voluntary activity. Okay. University affiliations, big, 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 big list. Most of this is described in, our, in the awards catalog for scholars. You will see and uh, it will be on the, on the next upcoming slides, we do have so-called joint grants with many Hungarian universities. What does this mean? This means that these are mostly teaching positions, lecturing, doesn't exclude research at all, where the university decides to um, kick in about half the cost. In other words, they contribute their own money to have the American professor teach in English at that university. And it's not just Hungarian students, but often you know, Erasmus students and other international students who happen to be in Hungary. But on this list, you see there's a very wide range of comprehensive universities that basically have everything from you know, medicine to technology to social sciences and so forth. And of course, there are quite a few um, specialized universities. And at this point, if you know what you'd like to do, let's say you want to be an instructor, you want to teach certain courses, but you don't know which university would be the most appropriate, the first step you should do is to contact us. According, according to the names in the catalog, mine's one of them, and my, my colleague's is the other name, and then we can suggest to you which universities have been hosting people in that particular field, and we can also connect to you to alumni, either alumni in your campus or American alumni who have been in Hungary and are working in the same field as you are. And then or Hungarians who have been in the U.S. who are you know, representing that same field. This is very important. So again, the matching of the person with the, with the host university is a critical step. And you can do a lot because let's say you don't have that familiarity with the various universities. They, they, may, they may not answer your email. They might give you an evasive answer. Don't worry about it because we can help. We can intervene. We can suggest people to you who would be more responsive. I don't know. How did you, you want to kick in here? So how I did it, uh, I started collaborating with somebody like a year or two before, and I was actually in country and went and met with Caroli um, before I, I made my application. But it, the fit is is really important, and I, I felt like I, I had a really good fit. And I did go through several people that I, I contacted before um, I found somebody that was a really good fit, and they were studying what I wanted to study and, and those kinds of things and were, and were really supportive. But the, the commission did really help out in that process when I went and met with them. and. I think sometimes we, we have the assumption that we're not supposed to contact them or those kinds of things, but they're actually there to help us. And the, the worst they can do is say, you know, give you an evasive answer. But the, the best they can do is say, you know, this is a great application, and why don't you consider contacting this university? They've been really supportive and have somebody doing the same thing. And so they can really provide you with that, that expertise that, that you don't have trying to make those connections. I mentioned these joint grants. Now, if you look in, in, our, in our awards catalog for scholars, you will see all of these described in detail. And again, people might say, well, you know, I just want to lecture on, you know, on art history. But there may be one here that really wants somebody to lecture on art history, and you may be the only one that ticks that box for that particular university. And so your odds have just gone up a great deal. Because it's in our interest to fill as many of these as possible. And not just because of the money, but because we are then, you know, shipping, delivering well-qualified American 
academics to their university to help them in curriculum development, in improving their courses, in providing maybe guidance to graduate students and so forth. Okay, so it's a much broader mission than simply showing up and delivering um, your lectures. And so this, this, this represents, you know, most of the major institutions in the country. Of course, you know, Semmelweis is a, is a, is a, is a medical school and you see the Hungarian Academy of Sciences on top, that is something that we sort of award uh, afterwards. If it turns out that your host institution is, is uh, affiliated with the Academy of Sciences, then they will throw in some extra money for you, which you can use you know, at will for you know, your travel expenses or other, other research expenses and so forth. But, but, but the rest of them are very specific, have very, very specific descriptions in our, in our um, awards catalog, so I would recommend that you go through these. Naturally, if you're, only, if you're interested in research, then you most likely will know which colleague at which university or institution or which archive you want to visit, and you're not going to really bother yourself with these, these things, because you know that you want to go to the Geophysical Institute and with Professor Kovac, and that's it. And that's fine, too. So the invitation letter is critical. Voluntary activity or off-duty activity, however you want to define it, is critical. And the third thing is the impact after your return from your posting. Is there any hope that there'll be an institutional relationship developed between your host abroad and your home, home university department? As there has been in your case, in the case of Brock's case too, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, you might not be able to see this, but the red line are the students and the blue are the number of scholar applicants. Now, for 23-24, it was only 19. Can you believe that? For 15 slots or so? I don't know what happened. Maybe it's the war in Ukraine. I think that has something to do with it. But, we, but you see there's a, there's a great deal of fluctuation from year to year, and it's very hard to predict. But you'll be in a pool of 20 to 30 people competing for half as many slots, more or less on average, if you look at the the 10, 15 year history of all this. And the number of awards, this will be kind of, it'll be kind of pegged at 14, 15 from now on. So that blue line will be up here someplace. So you have, some, you have, you have pretty good odds. I can't say too much about the other countries because I don't know their numbers as well. But for example, Poland, which has you know, almost four times the population of Hungary, only has twice as many grantees. You know, so. Any questions? No. <laughs> no, that's fine. No, we have this. We have a very friendly rivalry. We help each other a great deal. Okay. And this is what happens to you after a few years. Now, this was a trick. The Austrians were celebrating their, I don't know, 50th, 60th anniversary, and they said, "Hey, you stand in front of this box. It's one of those photo boxes." And someone came up to me and gave me a sign. Hold this, and it was over. Right? I didn't know what was on the sign, but. Full of schnitzel, I'd recommend that. And this is also true, I think, Ryan, you'd, be to, you'd attest to this, that you, that you will come back if you ever uh, come over on a, a Fulbright. And this is our boomer office. That's all, that's all, that's all we are. There's, there's only six of us um, working on this. I am the second, um, I have this, a second uh, fewer years of uh, longevity in that office. In other words, everyone's been there for 20, 30 years, which means that they like what they're doing and they're good at doing it, and they consider this to be a consider this to be sort of a, a mission way beyond just a, just a job. So that's something to keep in mind. And yes, you know, Hungary is a country of coffee and wine and other spirits, so it's a part of the cultural experience. Just as a warning, it's a trigger warning, right? <laughs> you will be tempted in all kinds of ways you never could imagine. Right? As, as, as am I every day as a mere mortal sinner like we all are. So thank you very much. What I would like to say is it's much more than a the academic part is really important and the cultural part, but I, I look at this picture and I see these people as like my family. I dinner at their houses. I, I've known them for years, um, and, and it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to kind of immerse yourself in a, the, both the academic culture but also this 
And one of the things he didn't talk about is how wonderful of an experience it is for your family. Like he, he briefly mentioned the activities they do. Um, my wife and children were over there. Um, once a month they do activities and it's not just come to their office and do things. It's like they organize where we go and visit this world-renowned porcelain factory in a rural part of Hungary and take a personalized tour and, and have wonderful meals. We, our children did not break anything. It was close, but... And so it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful like, family type of experience, and so it's just kind of a, a whole wraparound experience that, that I, I really can't speak enough, but I do look at these people and, and think of them as family. I know each one of them by name. Um, I've already set up where I'm going to meet with them again when I'm in country. Um, but I want to give Carole, and I want to thank Carole for, for being here, but I want to give him some time to take some questions from you guys. If you don't have a question, I will look at you and make you ask a question, please. One of the videos mentioned that timing is essential. Could you speak to that? Yeah, um, given the amount of time that it takes to put together the, the mere paperwork that's required, that's you know, administrative, and then you have to find a host who wants to, to, to meet you, and then you have to figure out how that will have a long-term impact beyond just, the, just the, the paper that you're going to write or the book chapter, that takes time. And you might have a hard time getting a response from people that you write to. So, but you have the but the deadline is when middle of September. For September 15th. Yeah, for scholars it's September fifteenth. For students, I guess it's September first, right, Sarah? Okay, so October. So the students have a slightly longer time. Um, and so I would, and and the, the the other factor is that you know Hungarian universities like to take it easy in the summer which means that from the middle of June to September 1st, you know, everyone's gone. I mean, it's hard to find people. So there's no last minute, you know, coordination or whatever, unless they really know you and they will and they'll return your calls. But so keep that in mind. So there's that, that, that kind of delay it's sort of built in. Yes, ma'am. Since I have a specific area, hmm? like if I wanted to find, if I wanted to find out about a specific area, who would I talk to? Like nursing, I'm in nursing education. Well, you look at our, our homepage and, and you contact Anna Maria right here. That's her. Um, we, we did have uh, a professors of nursing in, in Hungary from, uh, from NYU and other places who were doing research slash um, lecturing. So there are American alumni that I can connect you with who will you know, sort of give you the lay of the land. But but you have to you have to contact us. That's that's the main thing. A lot of commissions, the big ones like Germany and France and so forth, may not be as responsive. And I'm being very polite. And it's just you know it's just a scale problem, right? Yes. Okay. You emphasize the importance of. Um, voluntary activity, meeting people. Um, as members of the church, something very natural for us is to volunteer in a church congregation in the host country to spend a lot of time there and interact. Um, how would this be seen by the commission as a voluntary activity? Were well, you asking about the theological and, and religious composition of the crowd? Well, there are two Calvinists, I'm one of them, and there are four Roman Catholics. So what do you mean by church? No, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> no, but voluntary activity is voluntary activity, right? And many of the, uh, the NGOs are, are, are church-affiliated or, or um, established by people of faith. And it could be the Hare Krishnas, and it could be, it could be you know, the, uh, the Knights of Malta. It could be, you know, any organization. So that there's no... No, um, there's no uh, negative discrimination. Put it that way. So it's, it's not it's not a disadvantage to say I will work with and contact people that I know through my other connections. That that's not a problem. No, I'm sorry I didn't want to make any jokes, but it's just 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 to clarify the lay of the land. Okay, all right. Um, about you, I mean, did so you did you work? Um, I 
I worked with several nonprofit organizations, and I, I think one of the most rewarding things I realized is the more I put myself out there and the more uncomfortable I was, the more rewarding the experience was. And so I, I went out and sought out volunteer experiences for organizations working with individuals with disabilities. So I went to their school that served children with autism. There were some employment services and things, and I, I really, like, pounded on the doors and said, I want to come work with you and those kinds of things. And it, and it really provided some really rewarding opportunities that, that I had in, in doing that. And, and the, I think the church is great in things, but I think really putting yourself out there and getting involved in the community really provides those rewarding experiences. Oh, great. This is like Donahue, you know, right? <laughs> Running up and down. Because all of you are too young to know who Donahue was, right? Okay. Got a question about the inter-country lecturing program. Um, 